We will come to order at 7 p.m. in the chambers for our January 17th PMC meeting. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. <laughs> the Planning and Zoning Commission may not discuss these items but may respond with factual or policy information. The Planning and Zoning Commission may choose to place the item on a future agenda. The presiding officer may modify these times as deemed necessary. Do we have any speakers? No, we do not. Thank you. Before you uh, move on, though, let me remind the commission, based on a discussion I had last time, if you want to speak on something, uh, just flag me with your hand versus turning the mics on, because it's starting to create feedback issues sometimes when we do that, particularly if we have three or four of them on because people want to speak. So if you just kind of flag me, I'll, I'll get everybody in turn. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, please. Consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from this agenda for individual consideration by commissioners or staff. Would anyone like to remove a consent agenda item? Seeing none, I entertain a motion. I make a motion we approve the consent agenda item as presented. I'll second that. So I have a motion by Commissioner Brunoff with a second by Commissioner, or excuse me, Commissioner Ratliff. I saw you raise your hand first, but I'm too late. Too late. Motion by Commissioner Ratliff with a second by Commissioner Carey to, a pursuit, to approve the consent agenda. Please vote. And that item carries seven to zero. Uh, for the record, we are still short one commission member, although I think an appointment has been made and uh, sometime in the next few weeks we'll have that person seated. So, item one. Items for individual consideration, public hearing items. Unless instructed otherwise by the chair, speakers will be called in order registrations are received. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes of presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. Presiding officer may modify these times as deemed necessary. Administrative consideration <laughs> items must be approved if they meet city development regulations. Legislative consideration items are more discretionary except as constrained by legal considerations. Agenda item number one is a public hearing zoning case 2022-016. Request to amend Article 10, non-residential districts, Article 14, allowed uses and use classifications, Article 15, use specific regulations, and related sections of the zoning ordinance to align with specific land use policies in the comprehensive plan, I'm sorry, Comprehensive Plan 2021. Petitioner is City of Plano. This is for legislative consideration. Good evening, Commission. Uh, my name is Jordan Rockaby, Senior Planner with the uh, Planning Department. Uh, so as detailed, this is a zoning request to make amendments to uh, the zoning ordinance to uh, reflect some of the changes in the um, comprehensive plan. A brief uh, history of this case. Uh, the comprehensive plan was adopted by City Council on, in November of 2021. In January of last year, staff presented on a variety of topics at a joint session with City Council and the Commission. And in September of last year, the Commission called a public hearing to consider amendments to the zoning ordinance. Previously, four items have been discussed, these being independent living facilities in non-residential districts, residential uses in the uh, commercial employment district, residential uses in the Highway 75 corridor, and residential uses in the retail district. Uh, following the call for a public hearing, uh, staff brought forward two discussion and direction items to assist in preparing the draft amendments. Single family residential uses were the subject of the discussion on the December 17th, 2022 meeting, 
and multifamily residential uses were to be discussed at the January 3rd meeting. However, that item was tabled to a future joint meeting with city council. Following that meeting, staff has spoken with uh, Chair Downs on advancing some of the proposed amendments for consideration. So the proposal before you tonight is to um, amend the zoning ordinance to align standards for independent living facilities with multifamily uses, align permitted land uses in the CE district with the Employment Center's future land use dashboard, and to allow single family residential uses in the R district without an SUP. A, uh, no changes related to the Highway 75 corridor or the tabled multifamily uh, discussion and direction item are included in these proposed amendments. A separate zoning case would be brought forward uh, following the joint session with the city council. So I'll go through these uh, three items in brief, including a broad summary of what the proposed amendments entail. So as you know, independent living facilities are counted as a multifamily type in the comprehensive plan, but are considered an institutional type in the zoning ordinance. The proposed changes would address this inconsistency, inconsistency through four broad actions. First, independent living facilities would be recategorized as a primary residential use. This is largely administrative and would affect the land use tables and the parking schedule. Second, the development standards for independent living facilities would be aligned with those for multifamily dwellings. The intent is to ensure both uses are subject to the same standards where appropriate and one is not favored over the other. The third change would restrict new independent living facilities where multifamily uses are not supported by the comprehensive plan. The neighborhood corners, community corners, and employment centers future land use categories do not include multifamily uses in the desired land use mix. Land use categories are not zoning districts and do not directly regulate land use. So staff propose amending four zoning districts that generally overlap with these three categories. It's important to note that these four districts also don't allow multifamily use. These are the neighborhood office, general office, retail, and commercial employment zoning districts. Language would be added to each district allowing existing and otherwise vested independent living facility uses to remain without being considered legal nonconforming. The last change concerns continuing care facilities. Uh, staff had asked the commission whether standards for this use would be appropriate since a continuing care facility may include independent living independent. Uh, living units as part of the development. In response, the commission asked for additional info. Staff have reviewed peer municipalities and found that generally most do not define a continuing care use and those that do just use Plano's definition. On the subject of restrictive standards, staff have determined that it would be difficult and burdensome to create and enforce such standards, which might include caps on the proportion of independent living units or floor area relative to other retirement housing types. So instead of new standards, staff proposed to modify the definition of continuing care facilities to more closely match the definition found in the Texas Health and Safety Code, which more explicitly requires health-related services to be provided on the premises. For the Commercial Employment District, staff proposes changes to ensure the legacy area continues to be a desirable location for employers to locate. The CE district is largely located in the Employment Center's future land use category, which, as discussed with the independent living facilities item, does not support new residential uses. The district itself contains a unit cap, but allows new units to be constructed beyond this cap with the approval of an SUP. The same language is present in the Central Business One district. So, uh, two actions are proposed, and they're both fairly straightforward. The first is to restrict new residential land uses in the CE district, which entails removing residential standards from the district and updating the land use table, and updating the CE and CB1 districts to remove the unit cap language. Residential uses would continue to be permitted by SUP in the CB1 district, since it is largely located in an area where the comprehensive plan supports residential use. The proposed changes to the retail district are also straightforward. Uh, currently, some 
residential uses are permitted with a specific use permit, these being attached single family patio homes and duplexes. The neighborhood corners and community corners future land use categories support these uses, provided that they are compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. Staff proposes to remove the SUP requirement, which may be a barrier to new housing. The retail district already contains standards for the development site size and location of residential uses, so this would not create a free-for-all redevelopment scenario. Following the discussion on December 19, new modified standards on screening and fencing have been added to the ordinance. These are intended to ensure potential nuisances, such as loading areas, are appropriately screened while allowing for flexibility in creating connections between new residential developments and the shopping center. So to summarize, uh, staff propose amending the zoning ordinance to align standards for independent living facilities, the CE district, and the R district with specific policies in the comprehensive plan. A detailed list of the relevant comprehensive plan policies and actions is provided in the packet, but these include actions under the land use policy, redevelopment and growth management policy, neighborhood conservation policy, revitalization of retail shopping centers policy, and special housing needs policy. An overview of how these proposed, alignment, proposed amendments align with relevant future land use categories is also provided in the packet. Staff have received no responses for or against the proposal and recommend approval of the zoning ordinance amendments noted in Exhibit B of the packet. I'm sure there will be questions, so happy to answer any. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I thought the, what you had put out was very detailed um, despite being kind of dense and a little bit jargon, thank God we're all PNZ members here. We kind of learned, we've been educated on this. Um, I do have a couple of questions because um, independent living, we're removing it as something you could have in, I'm going to use commercial employment. <clears throat> but a continuing care facility is allowed there, and a continuing care facility may have certain sections or elements that are independent living. So if a developer approaches us and says, I want to build an independent living facility in CE, we're going to say no. If someone says, I'm going to build a continuing care facility, uh, and by the way, 80% of the units are independent living. I didn't see anything in here that said it allows a certain percentage to be independent living or something. And maybe it's in there, but again, fairly dense. So has that been discussed, or is there a guideline on that? So no, we're not proposing to introduce any um, restrictions on the proportion of independent living units okay. to other retirement housing units. When discussed at the staff level, it was deemed that that would be difficult to enforce, um, particularly right. in the long term. Um, right. And would we be sending property standards out to yeah. say how many of your units are independent living, how many? <laughs> No, I, I completely so. get that. I just was I'm thinking about it in terms, though, of I, I know that the definition of continuing care requires a certain level of uh, assistance by medical professionals, et, et cetera. But um, I, I don't know how we create something where, again, 5% of the units have treatment available to them, and the other 95% are just independent living. And, and maybe that's fine, but I, I thought we should have that discussion since it was unclear to me. You know, a developer will call something X, and it it isn't really X; it's something else with a little skin over it. So, uh, go ahead. Just to add to um, the prior comments, I think we discussed this a lot <laughs> at the staff level, so I understand what you're saying. One of the things that got us comfortable with this definition was really the comment that the continuum of personal services, nursing services, medical services, were provided on the same property. So that idea that you have to be providing those services on site, we didn't think it would be a practical application of development for someone to do 95% independent living and 5% because the expense of providing those services to okay. all units would just not be not Re be practical. Re reasonable. Yes. Um, okay. So Any we thought it was enforceable for that reason. Yeah, understood. Anyone else comments on this particular segment? 
Yeah, Commissioner Kerr. Yeah, I, I echo uh, what the Chairman said. I think this is well done. It, there is a lot here, but I think that's necessary to bring this forth. And I personally am excited to see address, us addressing the independent living because the way it was done before, I think, left some, some maybe some holes in there that we need to be addressed. So I, I applaud you guys for taking this on and the way you're bringing it forth. I think it's well done and, and makes sense to me. So good job. Thank you. Commissioner Bruno. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, excellent presentation, and want to thank the staff for all their hard work on this. Um, obviously, if we have a comprehensive plan, as we do, which was developed with a great deal of effort and a great deal of public input and, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, so to speak, uh, <clears throat> it behooves us to make sure that our other ordinances, specifically the zoning ordinance, is consistent with the comprehensive plan. I mean, after all, that is the purpose of the comprehensive plan. So I think this is a, nece this is a necessary uh, thing to do. Um, I think it's been discussed in great detail, and it's, I, it's in pretty much finished form. So I, I think we're ready to go ahead and approve it and send it to council. Now we got lots of hands no. up. Uh, and I didn't see who was, but. Whoops. All right, Commissioner Riley. Um, to echo the comments, I'm, I'm actually glad about the independent living, but I think we're still, gives you the flexibility and us the flexibility to allow for the senior housing that we so desperately need. But probably the one that I think is gonna make the biggest difference is the change to the R district. Right. Um, to allow some of the four corners to redevelop. And so I think I'm hopeful that five years from now we'll look back and say that was a positive change that we allowed some of those things to happen. So well done, it was a heavy read, but, uh, <laughs> but I, yeah. I, I could tell a lot of thought was put into it. Very Absolutely. well done. Very thorough. Um, my compliments to the authors. Thank you. Mr. Bronson. Uh, yeah, uh, again, thank you so much. Um, you did a great job. Um, Commissioner Brunoff, uh, yes, we cried. We uh, <laughs> argued, we bled uh, for almost midnight a couple times, so yes. Uh, I, I am very excited about um, bringing this up and having this go forward. I think you guys have done a great job on honoring all of the effort in the comprehensive plan. Um, and uh, I agree with Commissioner Ratliff, the ability for single family homes to be in the R district, I think is gonna be a very big positive. So thank you for the care and effort that you put forward to not only honor the CPRC and all of us, but the rest of the staff and everybody in Plano that I really think it is strongly behind the comprehensive plan. So thank you. Thank you. So the echo what everyone said. Um, the question I had was on the continuing care facilities and I'll confess I tried to read the Texas Health Code and my eyes glazed over. Um, what level of medical care triggers that facility getting that designation? Is it a fully fledged medical office with the appropriate, I don't know, uh, equipment on staff? Or do I just need to have a nurse that lives in one of the units and hey, voila, it's a continuing care facility? <laughs> do we know? I go back and read that statement again because I <laughs> thought that was quite oh, the statement. The, what the definition says uh, is that it's a development designed and staffed to provide housing together with a continuum of personal care services, nursing services, medical services, and, or other health-related services on the same property. So it, in addition, it states that it includes a combination of independent living, assisted living, or long-term care facilities. So I think we really like the idea of a continuum of services because it wasn't just you were going to have one service, you needed to provide something that was, you know, the continuity of the life cycle, that's the purpose of continuing care, that you're progressing um, through time uh, with different needs and that those different needs are being met through this combination of medical, nursing, health-related, um, food service, whatever it is that, that's needed to support the clients. So I think I will um, defer if others remember more about the Texas Health Code than I do, or have perhaps had a chance to look it up while I've been talking. <laughs> but uh, 
their it, eyes are all glazed. It, <laughs> you know? it, it, to me, it, we, we really expect, I think based on the definition, that it's going to be more robust. And forgive me, I might have missed this. Continuing care facilities in those particular zoning districts, are they permitted by right at this um, present time, or is it SUP? They're, they're, uh, they're generally permitted by oh, right. By I right. believe there's a couple where it's by SUP. Corridor, corridor commercials, uh, regional commercial, regional employment, or SUP. Yeah. Okay. And then just to, uh, to back up to the previous question on the level of um, medical care, um, I think it's important to note that in our definition of continuing care facility, we do explicitly state that it has to include um, a combination of other uses, which are defined in our zoning ordinance, and those other uses, um, assisted living facility, independent living facility, and long-term care facility, do have more detail on what care looks like, uh, and those definitions are in the packet. Um, exhibit D is the attachment with all those definitions. Thank you. That was what I was looking for, was to ensure that we had a high enough bar that it would be cost prohibitive to somebody to just go time. Um, I think it's important to note, too, that this ability to be located in some of these areas, the office and commercial areas, uh, we're still holding them to environmental health standards and stuff because it's a residential, but in a non-typical non-residential area. So, yes, sir. Just a question for Mr. Day. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've been in a number of these facilities and the architecture of an independent care facility is substantially different mm -hmm. than a continuing care facility when you look at the floor plans. So I presume that if somebody came in for that zoning and then the plans came in and it looked like an independent living facility, that's at that point you would go, eh, no, this does not comply with the zoning. Is that correct? Uh, yes, even the site planning is, is different. What we've seen in Plano is that there'll be actually a variety of uses on site. And so I think that's what we're really expecting to see. While it could all be in a single building, that's not the typical form that we've seen this take. Thank you. Commissioner Kerry. Thank you. Um, on uh, point 15.1, um, it talks about surviving members being able to um, mm -hmm. uh, in, live in the facility if the 55 and older um, occupant passes on. And, and my question is, is this, um, is a surviving member, do they have to be living there already? Or could somebody pass on and a member of the family that doesn't even live there move in? And it's probably not going to happen very much. But as I read through this, it, it was a curiosity to me, to me how we'd manage that particular thing if and when it happens. Um, and so I just, I'm curious what, what, the, what the outlook of that is. For sure. Um, so that's an existing standard in our ordinance. It's already there today. Um, I don't know if that has a basis in um, state law governing independent living facilities, perhaps. I'll just note um, it's surviving members of the household, and there is a definition in our zoning ordinance for household, um, and it, it talks about a domestic unit that resides in and shares in common a single dwelling unit and consists of individuals related by blood or marriage, so on and so forth. So they would have they to be would, living there at that time. From to, that to definition, I would believe so, yes. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming you need action on our part here. I move that we approve all of the recommendations as submitted. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Chair Downs, we yes. do have a speaker. Oh, we do? Okay. So, oh, yeah, we do. Sorry. I, withdraw. I thought it was just in support of it. Um, I'll withdraw that for now. Yeah, withdraw that for now because I didn't open the public hearing anyway. So thank you very much. Thank you. I was so excited we were moving forward. I... <laughs> thank you, everybody. I'll now open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers on this item? By we do. Uh... Well, that. <laughs> Ahad Shabir. Yes. Uh, hey, everyone. State your name and address, please. 
Sure. Uh, my name is Ahad Shabir. I reside on 440 Coit Road in apartment 9202 right here in Plano, Texas. I am a, I've lived there for about uh, one and a half years now, and I am generally in favor of most of the items in, or most of the points in item one. Uh, obviously, I'm very strongly in favor of um, single family housing and retail, particularly for um, attached single family housing, uh, platform housing, and uh, two family units or duplexes. I think those two units would be very appropriate for the retail employees in those section. Um, and having them live very close to their workplace is definitely um, a huge financial benefit for that demographic. Um, uh, I, I do think that we should try and explore maybe even potentially multifamily uses, although I understand it's a little bit of a stretch. And I do like the um, options already on the table um, because again, um, that would be uh, more cost open housing, open to um, reliable housing for uh, retail employees. And I think the added benefit of having residential communities living close, um, particularly, um, it could create very cohesive communities. Um, I'm thinking maybe that the children living in these homes could uh, not rely on their parents as much to maybe go to the theaters or, or go, you know, much of my friends would always go hit up the target for some reason. So um, it would allow a vehicle for some independence for children. And um, if we build communities around that concept, uh, around that concept, we can arrive at um, very strong cohesive communities with children that have hung out in these retail districts growing up and, and creating a very strong community in our city. Um, that's it. Uh, one of my one main skepticisms, and I understand that this is a part of the future land use. However, um, I am skeptical of removing multifamily housing from the uh, current, I think it's the CE, uh, the CE category, and it's the 2B EM category. Um, that's because particularly in the legacy West area, there is um, a large amount of mass transit uh, we have several dart lines going right through that area. So I think having some dense housing. Um, Sir, you have 30 seconds. Sure. Having some dense housing in that area would be very beneficial. Um, living close to the workplace is very attractive to younger people, um, particularly those who might be interning at some of those facilities or um, those who are very early on in their career. So, but that said, I am still largely in support of item one. Thank you. All right, thank you. Do we have any other speakers? No, we do not. Okay. Now I'll close the public hearing. Are you River Blum? Okay, I have you as registered opinion. Did you want to speak? I don't have you as being registered, but you're more than welcome to come up and speak. We'll just have you fill out a card after you. you've done so. All right, I'll reopen the public hearing. <laughs> so we apparently have more speakers. Can we, before you, are, is there anyone else that's gonna speak? Okay. Do, okay. And we have cards for them? Or? We do We do not, but I'll have them fill one out after they're done. Okay. Please give us your name and address, please. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> uh, my full name is Daniel Yahlom, 2200 Waterview Parkway down in Richardson. Uh, so I'm the president of a UTD advocacy group called Comets for Better Transit. I'm here to represent over 250 members, many of whom live or work in Plano, including areas that will be directly be affected by this proposal. I know that there's a lot of discussion on this from more technical perspectives, just like you saw from Ahad, but I want to bring up a bit of an unorthodox perspective right now. Most of our members don't have a car. They need to walk, bike, or use public transit to get to their destinations. When those are not options, they just cannot get where they need to get. Yet teenagers and college students are not the only people who face these types of problems. Recently, I had the opportunity to attend the Plano Citizens Coalition meeting. One of the officers told me they were seeing a decline in attendance because some of the members are getting too old to be able to drive at night, and that means that it is impossible for them to get to their meeting places. Imagine living most of your life being able to go 
anywhere you want to go, at any time you want to go, without having to rely on help or assistance from anyone else, and then one day losing that freedom for reasons that are entirely beyond your control. Can I ask for a show of hands for a second? Raise your hand if you own a car and you use it to get here today. Really? Technically, we're not supposed to respond, but continue. OK. Um, I hope you realize that there's something that's happening here, because the conversations we tend to hold in these types of planning meetings happen in a bit of a bubble. These meetings are supposed to be open to the entire Plano public. But the majority of people who can reliably show up here are people who have a car. Could your child come here on the of volition? What about your parents? As long as we keep building our cities in ways that assume everyone drives and pedestrians are second-class citizens, we are de facto denying most of them freedom of movement. And the most effective way to correct this injustice is not some increase in density or investments in expensive infrastructure, but simply making sure that people live within walking distance from the places where they study, work, shop, or congregate. Most of this proposal goes into great lengths to address this issue. And I genuinely applaud them, but some parts do not. Specifically, I take issue with parts that would significantly curtail future housing development in the CE districts. Um, I believe in the long term these would prove to be a mistake. I sincerely hope that as a comprehensive plan continues to be reassessed by people like you and city staff, that this part of the proposal gets reconsidered. But overall, I think it is a good proposal. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Ms. River, is that? Hello, uh, I'm River Bloom. I'm a, I live at 4000 Halifax Drive. Uh, I know that the first part of this, uh, I can't remember if it's the first part, but the part about uh, residential uses in commercial uh, employment districts uh, is part of the future land use, but I do think that uh, it should be considered that multifamily use uh, would be very beneficial in these areas. Uh, New, resident, new residential use, uses can be approved on a case-by-case -case basis uh, in these areas uh, if it is a part, uh, if there is no prohibition on multifamily uses. Uh, and residents may at that time express concerns, opposition, or support at those opportunities. Uh, multifamily housing uh, brings great benefits to commercial employment districts and uh, it can be vital and beneficial for Plano's economy. Uh, residential uses in the area uh, can also attract employers to the area uh, with people in the area being potential employees or interns, uh, especially younger people. Uh, this can foster strength and community in Plano, raising our ranks and being a great place to live and to raise a family. In addition, I want to affirm that I uh, strongly support the uh, permission of single family zoning in retail districts, uh, though I do think that it is in the interest of Plano's uh, economic and community development to allow multifamily in retail districts as well. Uh, on the whole, I think multifamily zoning should be uh, more unrestricted in Plano's standards and further consideration of the updates to these standards should have this in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No, no, we do not. All right. We'll close the hearing again. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Bruno. Uh, just a brief comment in response to the, to the comments we've just heard. Um, first of all, thank you for your comments. Um, I don't think there's anybody on this commission who is not strongly in favor of DART and public transit. I know I am. Uh, in the past, I have worked very hard to preserve public transit for the public. Um, we are in the process of considering, uh, on an ongoing basis, a transit-oriented development along the new DART Silver Line, which is under construction at this time. It's a light rail line starting uh, from uh, uh, far east Plano and um, intersecting with the uh, current uh, uh, red and orange lines and then proceeding out to DFW Airport. Um, I think uh, you might want to uh, uh, 
stay informed as to our future agendas. And if you are so motivated, please feel free to come and speak to us on the, the issue of transit-oriented development when, when that uh, returns to our agendas in the future. Um, I'd also point out that we have another case this evening on our agenda, which is the next case we'll consider, which is zoning case 2022-17, which does specifically consider all forms of residential housing, including single and multifamily in, very, in its various iterations, uh, next to uh, what we call neighborhood business design district, which is uh, a, um, a commercial and, and retail areas. Uh, and uh, those types of housing are divided into three different tiers according to the type of housing with standards for uh, the uh, placement and allocation of housing among those three tiers. So the issues you've raised are important and we are not neglecting them. Thank you. I think I'd also like to add that um, in the CE district, most likely what will happen there is through plan developments is a combination of residential, including multifamily, with retail, office, et cetera. So that CE district, it doesn't allow for a single multifamily development to be uh, in place. However, what will likely happen is a developer will put together a cohesive unit, kind of a mixed use type development that will include multifamily. So uh, thank you for being here and speaking, appreciate it. Okay, shall we circle back to Mr. Bronski? Would you like to repeat your yeah, uh, I would like to move that we accept uh, all of the recommendations of agenda item number one as submitted. Thank you, Commissioner Bronski. And we have a second by Commissioner Brunoff. So we have our motion and second now. Please vote. Item one carries seven to zero. Thank you, staff. We didn't leave you standing the way we did last time. Agenda item number two, public hearing, zoning case 2022-017, request to amend section 9.1700, RCD Residential Community Design District, section 10.1600, NBD Neighborhood Business Design District, and related sections of the zoning ordinance to improve alignment of the districts with Comprehensive Plan 2021. Petitioner is the City of Plano. This is for legislative consideration. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Christina Sebastian, Land Records Planning Manager. Um, as Ms. Bridges described, this is a request to amend the zoning ordinance to align two zoning districts, NBD and RCD, with the Comprehensive Plan 2021. As a reminder, these districts were first approved by the Commission in July of 2020. Uh, Council considered them the following month, but tabled them to allow time for the Comprehensive Plan Review Committee to work. In January of 2021, Council did approve the districts, but the Comprehensive Plan was still under review. So the districts were limited to the Plano Event Center site only, um, but council directed staff to revisit the districts once the comprehensive plan was complete. That happened in November of 2021. And then in September of last year, the commission heard a presentation on the, the potential amendments and called a public hearing. Um, and on December 19th of this past year, uh, the draft amendments were presented. As with the last case, uh, the, on January 3rd, some discussion and direction on multifamily tapes, types was uh, tabled by the commission. Um, and on the January 6th, staff spoke with the chair about advancing part of this case that had already been discussed, um, but saving the multifamily discussion for um, a joint meeting and uh, direction from the commission and council at that time. So you've heard about these cases a few times, so I will try to go through this quick review of the, the districts as they are today. Um, again, neighborhood business design, NBD, is for small-scale commercial uses. Residential community design, is RCD, is for small-scale residential. They are designed to be compatible, um, but also companion districts. Uh, the compa com compatibility of the be walkable Tree-lined streets, low-rise, uh, both have required open space, but they are companion districts and that either can be used alone, but NBD districts could, can include RCD housing types so that they could be used together. Uh, there is a need for these districts in that uh, what we have on the 
in the zoning ordinance otherwise has limited design standards, may allow more intense development or an insufficient housing mix, or requires specialized plan development districts, which may be appropriate in some cases, but can be inefficient to administer. So the NB NBD and RCD districts are market responsive to these needs to provide more variety in housing types and that small scale neighborhood non-residential use. Uh, so quickly, just some things that are similar between the two districts. Uh, they both require governance association, walkable streets, public open space, um, and have various building placement standards. Uh, they also have a two to one height to setback ratio from adjacent neighborhoods uh, to provide protection from light and noise and some additional privacy. For NBD, there's a requirement for a mix of at least three uses. And again, can use uh, those uses can be residential um, when following the RCD standards. There is an, a unique residential option for NBD called the Live Work Business Loft. This allows for ground floor commercial space with a single attached dwelling unit. Um, and it's, again, it's only permitted in the NBD district. For RCD, uh, there are eight housing types uh, divided into three tiers. So we have some single family detached units and duplex units for tier one. Tier two is single family lots, townhomes, and as, as it is today, uh, the, a manor home type, which allows up to six units in a building, but should be designed to appear as a single family home. And tier three includes stacked townhomes, which could be side by side or one on top of each other or a combination, and stacked flats, which allow up to nine units per building, but similar to the manor home should be designed to appear as a single family home with one main entrance. There are a, a variety of standards that require a specific housing mix based on these <coughs> tiers, uh, but the resulting mix results in a majority single family homes for RCD districts. So with that in mind, um, quickly I'll go over the, the alignment with the comprehensive plan changes. So as previously discussed, they, the districts do align quite well with the comprehensive plan, but there are some opportunities to modify them that, that mostly re re relate to the redevelopment and growth management policy. So for action RGM5, the amendment proposes making three changes to limit the residential square footage if, if it's a NBD district with residential uses to 50% residential square footage to require that for every two square feet of residential uses that are developed, at least one square foot of non-residential uses need to be developed and that usable open space and any planned trails be provided during the first phase of development. Related to redevelopment and growth management action nine, this one, the proposed changes essentially seek to move all multifamily types into tier three. Uh, so the changes as you see here, where stacked townhomes move to tier two, but manor homes move down to tier three. So this puts all the multifamily types in tier three. Tier three is already limited to 25% of the total units in the district. And then also tier three is only allowed currently when the district has over 100 units, but to align with RGM nine, that's proposed to only be allowed when the district has 10 acres or more. Uh, the proposed housing mix is very similar. It's really just the, the swap between the, the two plus the 10 acre limitation, um, but that puts all of the multifamily uses in that uh, 100 units or more, or, and, or over 100 units rather, um, and again, they're limited to 25% of the total units in the district. So, here we reviewed the future land use categories and dashboards, as, as well as the desirable character defining elements. Um, so there's a slide in, or there's an attachment in your packet, and the slide has a lot of information on it. Don't expect you to be able to really see this, um, but we did compare each future land use category with the MBD district and RCD housing types, uh, and the change with the proposed changes that we just discussed, and the neighborhoods and employment centers were found not to be in alignment, 
but neighborhood corners, community corners, suburban activity centers, urban activity centers, downtown corridors, and expressway corridors all align fairly well with some slight variations where they, the alignment is not perfect um, highlighted there on the slide. So with this in mind, um, the amendment proposes expanding the availability of the districts to locations uh, outside, basically citywide, um, where they're compatible with surrounding residential neighborhoods and the, the projects align with the comprehensive plan. Um, and I do apologize, there was a small typo in the staff report for the RCD purpose statement, uh, but page one of exhibit E has the correct verbiage, um, just says various uses and should say um, the district. Um, so we want to note that if the availability of the districts is expanded as proposed, whenever a zoning change comes in for an MBD or RCD district, as with all zoning changes, the future land use dashboards will apply. Each request would be considered individually. Um, and then PNC may determine that the districts are not in conformance with the future land use dashboards. Um, but for MBD and RCD districts, PNC and, and city council may amend the base standards for each district to meet those specific recommendations of the future land use categories. So that, that is an opportunity um, for those, ish, those places where things did not align necessarily perfectly. However, there, as the districts are written now, there are a few standards that the, PN, the commission and council may not amend. And one of those is minimum and maximum densities. The, the, the RCD district requires a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 20 dwelling units per acre. So to provide more flexibility to the commission and council to utilize these districts and better align with the future land use map and dashboards, uh, we're proposing in the amendment to change the exceptions so that um, you can, uh, the commission and council can amend the minimum and maximum densities when they are the, the, the proposal for the NBD or RCD district with implementing comprehensive plan 2021. On uh, December 19th, I think, um, yes, the commission uh, asked a question about freestanding non-residential buildings. There was an existing standard in the NBD district to restrict these buildings to a floor area of at least 5,000 square feet. Uh, this standard mirrors the standard in the urban mixed use district, uh, which is larger there, um, but that was really added at the time for UMU to limit development of pad sites. Um, after further consideration, um, we feel that this may actually be overly restrictive because the MBD district is designed for small-scale commercial buildings. Uh, and it already has a, a variety of standards to make it, uh, the districts more pedestrian-friendly, uh, parking behind front building facades, prohibitions on drive-up windows, and so forth. Uh, so we are proposing to simply remove the standard to provide more flexibility for these districts as they come in. And we have already discussed um, how many things in this proposal align with the comprehensive plan, but there are a variety of other policies uh, where this amendment aligns as well, uh, especially land use, neighborhood conservation, and revitalization of retail shopping centers. And with that, this amendment is recommended for approval per the amendments noted in Exhibit E. Uh, there was one response in support at the December 5th public hearing, but no other responses otherwise. And I'm available for any questions. Is there a reason, <clears throat> if we don't say 5,000 feet, is there a reason to say 10,000 square feet or 20,000 square feet? Is there a reason or is it just so unlikely to happen in this type of district that we need to be concerned with somebody building a large pad site? My understanding was the reason for adding the limitation was to prevent it from turning into one big building in an area where so many other uses could be supported. So that's, I guess that's my question for you is, was it discussed having any limitation or it says we're gonna remove that? So the, the limitation is, as, as it is today, is that Freestanding buildings need to be 5,000 or, or greater, and... Oh, I'm sorry, then I'm going the other direction. Is there a reason to have a cap on it? In other words, if, 
if what we're intending in these type of design districts isn't <clears throat> a large single building, but instead, you know, uh, I, I guess more mixed of uses and stuff. Have we ever done that, or is that something we should consider in this kind? I'm going the opposite direction of what you were suggesting, which was we want it to be at least 5,000 feet. That may be something to consider. There are a few standards that would kind of restrict overly large buildings, like block size and block length, um, but I don't know right off kind of what that might okay. calculate up to. So. I, and I, nobody else may have that concern. And maybe you're right. I, I'm thinking of it in terms of kind of open-ended, but the truth is there's probably other elements of the district that would keep that from happening. So I was, when you saw when you said you were going to remove it, I was thinking to myself, we need some limitation. I wasn't thinking about it in terms of it limiting to somebody wanting to build a 1,000 square foot, you know, pad site. So by removing it, Again, we, we're giving them the option of building smaller pad sites, but we don't have it capped to be something larger. We're going to rely on other elements within the design district itself because of, as you said, block sizes, et cetera, to prevent that. Right, and, and those, those smaller pad sites would be less like the traditional pad sites that we see uh, in the other retail areas with limited parking lots in front of the pad sites and things like that to make it a more walkable area. Well, I guess, mm -hmm. I mean, there was a new little coffee shop put up right at the corner of Parker and Custer, and it can't be more than about 300 square feet. You know, now it's a drive through but it could be walk-up, I guess, as a mm -hmm. coffee shop. Okay. Any other questions for staff? And just questions at this point, because we do have a speaker on this, so we're going to go to the public hearing, and then we'll come back. But questions? Yes, sir. Just more of a comment, but um, thank you for revisiting that 5,000 feet because I think I mentioned last time, I'm very familiar with the neighborhood where you take a lot of these pictures. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest building in that neighborhood is probably 10 or 12,000 feet, and, and it's two-story. So um, I think the goal of trying to have a walkable cottage kind of environment, which is what you're portraying in a lot of the pictures, is achieved by setting that standard. Although I do think we probably depending on how it evolves, there, you might want a thousand foot minimum or something because there are some pretty small buildings, coffee shops, walk up kind of deals that, that have popped up in that other neighborhood or exist in that other neighborhood. Um, but the larger buildings just, it's, it's too dense. It doesn't make sense. So and I'm not worried about the big buildings, but I think, you know, we might look at 500, a thousand, something as a minimum just because I think you do have to have some concern about for lack of a better term a tiny house popping in there with a coffee shop inside it um, but uh, but overall I think the, the changes you made since the last meeting are absolutely spot on so thank you for that okay no more questions and we'll open the public hearing thank you and we have Ahad Shabir. While he's coming down, is there anyone else that's going to speak on this one? Yes, we have okay. Dan Daniel Yahalom. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I do want to express my uh, enthusiastic support for item two. I think it's a very efficient, uh, fiscally responsible land use for Plano. I think having that sort of mixed use clustered um, land use is going to be very profitable. In the future we see that like in other areas where that kind of thing exists, um, those land values are a lot higher. Um, I also do want to zone, uh, zone out a little bit and um, talk about, you know, the, the over time how our need for the third place, so the place that we go that is in addition from home, in addition to work, but that third place where we can congregate as a community has like faded over time. And I am glad to hear that um, the items in the future land use and item two uh, in this meeting will further generate those, uh, regenerate those third places uh, from uh, those, like maybe it's a neighborhood cafe, for example, where everyone goes and congregates to meet there. Um, I'm sure that uh, many of you uh, have graduated college. You can think of like uh, a lot of college campuses have their third place. You know, maybe it's a student union 
or something of that nature. Maybe it's even a football field. And as we, and one of my biggest fears, you know, going into adulthood, you know, having a job and all those things is where is that, is losing that third place and losing that sense of community. And I'm really glad that the council is prioritizing um, mixed use, which will help incentivize that third place to uh, be constructed. Uh, that's all for me. Oh, and another thing is that I do think that these changes will also make it very attractive for younger uh, professionals to come to Plano. And yeah, that's all I have for today. Thank you. Next speaker. Daniel Yahalom. Are all of you guys from UTD? Yeah. Yeah. They're kind of my gang. I'm yours, you're not them. Um, so again, Daniel Yahalom, 2200 Waterview Parkway. I also wholeheartedly support this item as is. I actually want to bring up one advantage of it that may not seem as obvious because it's a bit in the fine print. Some of the fine print of the specific districts, I don't know if it's as is or as amended, but I know it's going to stay there either way, is that phasing requirements for developers who are building large developments, in this case, not one big building, but multiple small buildings in the same neighborhood, are put as part of the city ordinance rather than the individual ordinances that um, you know, this commission or council would have to make with the developer. Um, last semester, we spent a lot of energy dealing with the city of Richardson to get them to support a mixed-use development. And the general consensus was everyone wanted it to happen. Everyone wanted to see this kind of development where multiple uses would happen in the same place. But the issue they ran up to is they tried to do this development in the PD district. And of course, PD districts by default don't have any sort of phasing requirement built in. And so you had a lot of conflict between the city and the developer trying to shoehorn a phasing requirement into a PD district that just tends to not work. It puts an undue burden on the developer because it puts them in tension with contractors, with the banks. It puts an undue burden on the city because it suddenly lengthens negotiations quite a bit. I think having that requirement built in is a very, very smart move and addresses an issue that you might not even know that you could be having with these types of districts in the first place. So that's it. Thank you. Any other speakers? No, we do not. All right. We'll close the public hearing and find discussion with the commission. Commissioner Bruno, microphone, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again to the speakers uh, for your insightful comments. Um, I think as we all are aware, uh, Plato has pretty much maxed out its boundaries. There is no more room for annexing additional land into the city. Uh, we are likewise running out of room for any sort of sizable new development within the city, what we're looking at for the future primarily is redevelopment. And uh, specifically, I think targeting the older, uh, older commercial areas located on the corners of, ma of the, the major intersections, uh, which are you know, showing a greater uh, incidence of vacancy these days as a result of the pandemic and people you know, abandoning brick and mortar shopping and going, you know, ordering things online from Amazon and so forth. Um, and so I think this, this item provides an incentive to property owners of those developments to uh, take the bull by the horns and redevelop their properties into an attractive mixed use combination of commercial and compatible residential uses that interact well with each other provide amenities for the, uh, the beautification and the, uh, the, you know, the betterment and the desirability of both the commercial and the residential properties. Um, uh, so because of the incentive that's being provided, I think this is a good thing. It gives us a chance to guide and plan for the future development of the city instead of just letting it happen and being overwhelmed by it. Uh, as an example, I'd point out that um, Collin Creek Mall is no longer with us and it is being redeveloped without the benefit of these standards. If these standards had been in place, I think the redevelopment that's going on at Collin Creek Mall would probably look very different. But it is what it is, and of course, it, it, it has the right to continue. So I'm in favor of this. I just might add parenthetically, if somebody wants to put up a standalone you know, Starbucks in a residential area, which is you know, much less than 5,000 square feet, so the residents can just, you know, walk over, pop over and get a cup of coffee. I think that's a good thing. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. You like coffee. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I, I think it's been suggested 
by Commissioner Ratliff, I'm I'm wondering where since rather than just simply remove that 5,000 square foot limitation, do we want to keep it but change that number? Is there a general sense on that item from anybody? Commissioner Kerry. Yeah, I, I understand the point, but uh, I don't know that I'm concerned about that. You know, um, the, um, you know the, I think the coffee shop you were referencing before up in Parker is called Scooters. Yeah. And um, it's a pretty cool little place. Yeah. And to Commissioner Bronhoff's point of view, if they pop up in some places to provide uh, service to, to uh, local residents. I think that's good. So okay. I, I understand the point. I personally am not as concerned about it because ultimately there, there's an economic uh, design yeah. there. So. Yeah. Yeah. So. Took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, a friend of mine actually just opened a scooters in Watauga. So I, okay. I'm very familiar <laughs> with the footprint. Um, but within the capped space that is in Plano, the economy uh, the economics of the development would govern, yeah. you know, what you, what you put in there. So um, unless somebody wants to be really silly to just poke the boundaries and put, you know, a 200-square-foot tiny house, yeah. I'm not as worried. Okay. Commissioner Tom. Um, I kind of agree that your concern earlier, the pres uh, our um, chair concerned earlier, should we put a boundary on like the maximum? Right now, I think we're removing the uh, minimum. minimum requirement, right? Mm -hmm. So if we have a uh, requirements for this district to work, we want to mix with a smaller units, like smaller retail space, office space, with smaller residential spaces. If we put a big box retail there, would it you know, defeat the purpose of the district, right? Should we put a, like a limit on percentage maybe of if the land use entire development is this much, it, the single unit cannot be larger than 50% or something. Should we consider that? Okay. I, I'm going to come back to what you said about the other design standards limiting that a little bit, and I'm just taking at face value that that's kind of what would be the limiting factor you go ahead that and then i was reminded there is another standard that no single tenant may occupy more than thirty thousand square feet of the ground floor of a building so that would limit the opportunity for big boxes um right. at least in the traditional sense they it's ground floor only so could could go up well and that limitation would also <coughs> be an economic factor for somebody trying to build it because they're, you know, what are you going to find a 30,000 square foot tenant? Who knows? So, okay. Not too much. Not too much. Okay. Anything else? Uh, Commissioner Bronski? No? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I'm very happy that people like the phasing requirement. That was uh, something I worked very hard on the CPRC to get to in the comprehensive plan. And I'm excited about bringing all of this together. And uh, I move that we accept the recommendations as submitted. So we have a motion by Commissioner Bronski with a second. second by Commissioner Ratliff to approve item two as recommended. Please vote. And that item carries 7 0. Thanks again for being here and for your input. Non public hearing items. The presiding officer will permit limited public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency and may include a total time limit. Agenda item number three discussion and direction. Thoroughfare standards, rules, and regulations update. Discuss and direction pertaining to section 12. Traffic impact analysis as part of the update of the city's thoroughfare standards, rules, and regulations. Applicant is City of Plano. Good evening, Commission. My name is Jason April. I'm the Senior Mobility Planner with the Planning Department. The Planning and Engineering Departments are working to update the city's thoroughfare standards, rules, and regulations. The document regulates the minimum standards for the design and construction of streets, sidewalks, and other ro roadway design elements within the city. As a reminder, this was last updated in 2009, and we've contracted with Kimley Horn to assess the existing standards and develop the new transportation to, up, to develop a new transportation design manual. 
We're aiming to finalize this very soon, this spring. The purpose of Section 12 is to establish the requirements and the procedures pertaining to the development of a traffic impact analysis. The updates to the current thoroughfare standards are guided by the policies and actions within the roadway system policy of the Comprehensive Plan 2021, which included action steps to review and update traffic impact assessment thresholds and standards, as shown in the PowerPoint. A TIA is a specialized study that determines the potential impacts of a proposed de development project, identifies any necessary transportation improvements required to ensure a satisfactory level of service on all affected thoroughfares, and establishes the timing and cost sharing agreements for the construction of said improvements. Both the city and the land developer are responsible for considering all reasonable solutions to mitigate any adverse impacts caused by development, such as increased roadway traffic congestion and any safety conditions. Plano first adopted its TIA ordinance in the late 1980s. The ordinance was developed when the city's street system was incomplete and many options for mitigating traffic impacts were still available, including street widening, intersection improvements, and amending the thoroughfare plan. The city was in a period of rapid growth in the 1980s, and I'm sure you're all aware, and the street system was significantly less built out than it is today. TIAs were evaluated as part of a zoning change request or preliminary site plan for developments that generated 5,000 tri daily trips or greater, 5,000 daily trips or greater. The results of the TIA included where improvements were required to maintain a targeted level of service at nearby intersections. In 2010, the city's thoroughfare system was largely complete. However, traffic conditions were worsening due to regional growth and options for mitigation became more limited. Many intersections in the city of Plano were heavily congested during peak commuting hours and even with construction to the full developed standard of dual left turn lanes and free right turn lanes, they would not improve to the city's minimum service standard. As a result, the city's TIA regulations were revised to remove the requirement for TIA at the time of zoning and increase the threshold to require a TIA at site plans to 8,000 daily trips or greater. This was intended to tailor the TIA process to large scale developments and focus mitigation options to on-site improvements that can be made associated with that development. These continue as the current TIA requirements in Article 25 of the Zoning Ordinance. <clears throat> Today, there's an increasing, increasing need to evaluate the impacts of new development and redevelopment at the time of zoning changes including small to medium scale development projects. The current trip generation threshold of 8,000 daily trips is considered high. Updates to this process included in section 12 aim to make the process clearer for both owners and developers. Expectations are somewhat unclear on when an, excuse me, ex expectations are somewhat unclear on when a TIA is appropriate and when these proposed updates aim to make the TIA easier to regulate as a whole. For example, in recent years, developers have voluntarily submitted TIAs as part of a zoning case upon staff recommendation. However, this has not followed the formal process adopted in the ordinance because it's not technically a requirement. The updates in section 12 aim to make the process easier, easier to regulate as well. To better meet current needs, Section 12 proposes a tiered approach to traffic analysis based on the number of peak hours or total daily trips generated by the development. A traffic generation report will generally be required for zoning change requests, plan developments, specific use permits, development plans, preliminary site plans, and site plans. A traffic generation report will contain the project location, land use, and the proposed development's intensity based on full build out for the site plan. By requiring a traffic generation report, the process will be more uniform and clearer to all involved.
The flowchart in the PowerPoint illustrates the process for determining if additional traffic studies are required after the, additional, after the uh, completion of the traffic generation report. The trip generation numbers from the traffic generation report will be used to determine if, additional, if an additional study is needed in the form of a traffic engineering assessment, traffic impact analysis, or regional traffic impact analysis. So you can see in the flow chart what type of development requests require a traffic generation report. The traffic generation report shows trips generated, peak hour trips or total daily trips, and you can follow that down if the trips generated, for example, are under 50, no further study required. On the other end, over 500 peak hour trips or over 3,000 total daily trips, a regional TIA would be required. This slide summarizes details outlined in section 12 for each of the traffic studies that may be required. A traffic engineering assessment would include trip generation distribution at proposed access points. A TIA would include all intersections at the proposed development with adjacent roadway system. And a regional TIA would have the largest footprint, and it's the large purple circle in my figure where it's traffic engineering assessment TIA, regional TIA. That would have the largest footprint and would include all intersections of the proposed development and adjacent major intersections within a one mile radius from the property line. Section 12 also outlines the information that we would be required for TIAs and uh, regional transportation impact analysis, RTIAs. At a high level, the memo would include at least the project information, existing and proposed site uses that would include the site, so that would include the location and study area, existing development, the existing zoning, and proposed development. It would also report on the transportation system, uh, site traffic characteristics, analysis scenarios, and traffic volumes, such as projected traffic volumes for build out, uh, traffic analysis, and finally mitigation measures that would aim to keep the level at, of service at targeted levels. Section 12 also outlines the role of engineering staff who will evaluate the components of the methodology memo. The section provides consistency for staff review as well. Mitigation solutions will be coordinated between engineering and the developer or property owner. The TIA must provide details for mitigations required within study area intersections and roadway links to operate at an acceptable level of service. The TIA will include the time frame when mitigations are needed and the responsible party for mitigation implementation. And options for mitigation um, include but are not limited to the items on the screen. So pedestrian facilities, control improvements, um, dedicating right of way example, for example. TIAs, when required, will be provided as supporting information to concept plans, preliminary site plans, development plans, and various zoning, ch zoning change applications. Based on the information provided, the PNZ and city and council where applicable will have the following authority. So for zoning changes, proposed mitigation in the TIA should be implemented as part of the associated project. And for site plans, when submitted as part of the site plan process, the proposed mitigation may include as conditions of approval. So the update to the thoroughfare standards and for this topic in particular will likely require housekeeping and updates to various related ordinances. As I've mentioned, I, I believe in previous presentations uh, for this particular item, changes to article three site plan review and article 25 traffic impact analysis would be likely as well as possible changes to the subdivision ordinance. Staff recommends that the commission provide direction on section 12 as part of the update of the city's thoroughfare standards rules and regulations. And I want to let you know that Brian Shusky, the transportation engineering manager is here to answer questions related to traffic impact analysis. Um, they've been working, we've been working in tandem directly with them on the update for section 12 and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So 
I think there's going to be quite a few. I, out of my peripheral vision, I could see who's <laughs> going. Um, I, I, I assume there'd be questions tonight. Let, let's let's start with this uh, peak hour trips. How do you determine how many peak hour trips there'll be? Is there a standard guidebook out there that says you have a thirty thousand square foot office building, you're going to have X, or you've got a three hundred unit apartment complex, you're going to have Y? Is it literally that simple? It is that simple. Since they're late, late 1970s, uh, and it's been updated every year since then, the Institute of Transportation Engineers has published a trip generation manual that takes into account every kind of land use uh, known to man in every kind of building and has studies, in, actual physical studies, where they've they've counted uh, in in some cases hundreds of studies, mm -hmm. so we have the have the data, uh, okay. and so once we know what's being built, how many square feet, how many uh, residential or how many uh, apartments uh, are, are going to be in it, or whatever the, the the land use is, then we can calculate uh, what the chip generation is. Does it break down as as literally three hundred unit apartment, but uh, 150 or one bedroom, 100 or two bedroom, 50 or three bedroom, and it breaks it down and said based on that ratio, you're going to have X number of. It, it absolutely does, and, and okay. it gives you the AM peak period, the off peak period, the PM peak period, the daily traffic volumes, okay, or trip generations, and and weekend. And what defines the peak hours? So is it seven to nine, or is it? So it actually has, it actually has two different peak hours in there. So it has a. A peak hour of the street, oh, okay. right? So you calculate what the street volumes are, and so the peak hour volume, yep. you can do that, or you can have the peak of the the actual unit itself. The so sometimes uh, apartment complexes, they might disperse their, their folks from 6:30 to 7:30. I'm just picking yep. numbers, 6:30 yeah, yeah. to 7:30. But the peak hour of the street might actually be, um, you know, yep. 7:45 to 8:45. Okay. So it depends on uh, and we actually like to use the peak hour of the street mm -hmm. uh, as our standard, but other agencies use peak hour of the of the of the actual units. Okay, and then this range that that you've kind of come up with here, under 50, 50 to two hundred, two hundred one to five hundred, and over five hundred, is that random or no? There's a science to those those number ranges. I, I actually. I'm not quite sure I can get back to you on, on that yeah. question. Right. Yes, but I just want you to come up there. Chad is one of our senior or traffic engineers. Chad Ostrander, traffic engineer for City of Plano. Um, I helped develop this, this breakdown, and the, the thresholds were determined uh, based on what other cities in the area are doing, um, as well as what we are requiring for other parts of our uh, manual. For example, um, in section two or three, where we break down when right turn lanes are required. Um, we, we require 75 vehicles turning right into the development uh, will trigger a, right, a need for a right turn lane. And so that 50 to 200 um, lets us analyze that range. Okay. Um, and that, that's what that traffic engineering assessment okay. is used for, is, is right and left turn bays and median openings. Uh, and then the 200 to 500, and then the over 500 to uh, over 5,000 a day, uh, that is very similar to what Frisco, McKinney, Allen, and some other, other cities in the area are, are performing. Okay, very good. Let's, I think the first hand I saw was over here. Uh, Commissioner Ali, we'll let you start. Uh, I think some of my question has been answered. I was trying to figure out if there's a standard methodology. It's not that somebody just picks up methodology from the internet and submits it as their TIA or whatever, but it sounds like there is a standard. Do we give the developer the standard to follow that what, for what we expect to see um, for the traffic engineering assessment or the traffic study, or do we let them come to us with a, their results of some kind of assessment and we measure it against what our standards are or what our expectations are? I would say, so during the process of the TIA and the RTIA, the developer and property owner would be working directly with engineering staff. And so through that process, 
um, the, the process would be vetted what's appropriate and what's not. Okay. Um, I don't think this was answered. It was a question generated by the report. The 1,500 to 3,000, for instance, was that gross or is that a net change um, in terms of a threshold? Like in, in the report, it called out the public looked at it from a net change perspective, or I'm mis make, mixing this up, and the developer tends to look at it from a gross perspective. What's our stand? So you're asking, are the peak hour trips or the total daily trips, is that gross? Is that gross or is that a net change from what the status quo for that area would be? <laughs> it's actually supposed to be the additional trips generated by a site in a, in a redevelopment. So if you have a redevelopment and it's generating, the existing development's generating 2,000 trips per day and the redevelopment generates 6,000, then that would trigger uh, a, a regional. So it's, okay. it's and, so, I, and I think this has been mentioned before here, so if you go back to Collin Creek Mall, that development that was there, the redevelopment, did not require a traffic impact study because the existing, if, if it was actually being used, mm -hmm. and the, the, the new development actually had almost identical uh, annual trips or, or daily trips per day, which is around 55,000. So it did not trigger the need for one, but they did one anyways, uh, fortunately. Okay, so if, let me phrase it um, from my understanding. If uh, the current development already generates 3,000 um, total daily trips and the redevelopment was gonna add another 1,500 to it, that would trigger a traffic impact analysis, not original TIA, which makes it 4,500. That's correct. Okay. Um, last question, I think this, I know the answer to this. Um, this is an either or, so either one of these tripwires need to be triggered to generate assessment versus regional versus TIA. Either it's a peak or a total, one of the two. It doesn't have to be two, um, both. Either or. Either right. or. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Commissioner Ratliff. Um, thank you. Um, you're making me put on my traffic engineering hat. It's been a long time since I've worn it, so I apologize. Um, when you're looking at a greenfield development, you have a few left. Do you base the TIA on current zoning or current land use that you use when you design the streets? Or if it's going from pasture to 150 units, then uh, they've got to do a TIA based on that increase? Or is it based on what it could be under its current zoning, even though it's a green field? I'm actually not quite sure. Yeah, no, it is, it's based, it factors in existing zoning. The methodology memo includes a certain set of practical considerations that we can consider when engineering is, is having these discussions with the applicant. So the idea of the mall is a good example. We can now consider vacancy rate in the existing conditions and things like that to get a more realistic picture. I was thinking about some of the vacant land that still exists up around the legacy area. So, but obviously a lot of the infrastructure is already in place for that vacant land. So as that vacant land comes through zoning, if it's a track that generates 210 peak trips, but it was anticipated it would generate 300, even though it's a green field, are they gonna have to go back and do the TIA? I guess would be my question. It's currently written, it's based on existing zoning. So if it were say an ag zoning, then it, it wouldn't have those trips. But if it had some other type of commercial zoning, it'd be based on what the commercial zoning floor area ratios would allow as a starting place. Okay. Um, when on the regional traffic impact analysis, how did we come up with the one mile radius? And the reason I asked the question is, Collin Creek's a great example. The, it's got major infrastructure on all four sides. But if you're up in an area of town that only has minor or arterials around it, how far out, the mile may not be enough if it's a very dense development that's gonna generate a lot of trips. So, so how did the one mile come in and is that 
a judgment call by staff to say, I think you need to go two more intersections down. Is that, do you have the discretion to expand that boundary if it's gonna be a significant change? The answer is yes, and we actually have discretion to reduce the boundary also. So, uh, so the answer is yes, we have discretion to, to, to change that. And on the reduction side, we have several locations where we have literally maxed out uh, an intersection, dual left turns on every approach, right turns on every approach. So reanalyzing an intersection that can't possibly have any additional improvements uh, doesn't make sense. So we can, we'll, we'll take that in consideration. Okay, so the one mile is not a hard and fast rule. That's kind of where you start and then you can... It's a negotiation. Okay, that, that's, that was my question. So. And I, it, it was kind of stated, but in the beginning, uh, when, whenever this does happen, we sit down with the applicant and go through all the different things that are, that are required and it, you know, based on what their development is. And so during that time, we'll, we'll discuss what the limits are gonna be. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but at least in my projects, there's only a handful of really good traffic engineers in town. Um, and so my experience has been they all pretty well use the same methodology. Um, is there- is The methodology there... is standardized. The, the, the problem is there, there are a, a handful uh, but there are a lot of uh, individual, like number of pass by trips, the, the number of uh, internal capture trips, uh, the percent uh, percentages on uh, coming from different locations. Um, and so sometimes some consultants, I'm not saying all, but some, and I spent 33 years in consulting, so I, I know this for a fact, <laughs> but some consultants will say and, and minimize the number of trips generated to minimize the impact of the of the site, uh, and then there's a lot of consultants uh, that will do it th the correct way to, to show what the total total uh, impact is. And that's why we count on you to review it. Pardon? And that's why we count on you to review it. Yes. So okay, thank you. That was my question. Since we're going around the dais, I'm going to ask another one. You you said that we're using our our trip counts based on a system developed in 1970. Or the numbers? Or that was when it was originally developed, okay. and it's been literally updated with studies uh, ever since. And is it 11, uh, version 11 now? Or? Yes. Yeah, so we're, we're on version it? 11 of the chip generation manual. And when, when was version 11? When did that come out? I'm wondering. 2020? Yeah, within the last couple of years. They just added marijuana dispensaries to the... the okay. The okay. So it is, it is very There's very enough of those around to require. Uh, so, so uh, all right. I, I guess the reason I, I was just looking to see because certainly the pandemic and the change in technology and how we operate and work remotely and everything else should be having some impact on our traffic, particularly peak hour where people have a lot more flexibility and when they might be leaving. So I was just curious how current that was and if it reflected trends that have taken place over the last couple of years. So anyway, uh, Commissioner Kerry, we're just going around the yeah, horn here. Perfect. Uh, simple question, I think. Uh, just a, a couple of things. If this is implemented, what effects do you think it's going to have on staff in terms of workflow as well as costs, if, if any? Uh, how does this benefit us uh, if implemented? Well, actually, we're, we're eliminating some uh, unclear areas. Uh, in here, so it's actually going to help us uh, in in our the number of of uh, TIAs that we'll have to review will increase somewhat. Uh, but I'd rather take that and improve the safety and capacity uh, of our system, uh, which is the number number one and number two priority for the transportation division. So we're, the staff uh, time is going to increase somewhat, but uh, it is, is something that's very, very, very well needed um, to improve, again, safety and, and capacity. Yeah, it looks like it's going to provide some transparency to, to outside people, and I, I think it probably will improve workflow. It might increase it some, but might might improve it as well. So anyway, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Tom. Um, first of all, I love the presentation. I think I want to thank all of you for doing a great job of putting all these complicated concept into very clear blocks and flow charts and love flow charts personally and I love the colors 
So great job. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing she dislikes about that. It's all good. Exactly. But the question I have is that I love how you um, require them to generate the traffic generation reports so that we can do uh, determine whether a uh, traffic impact report is required or what kind of impact report is required. Um, my question is, instead of having a absolute number to measure the traffic generated, is there another approach? Maybe that's something related to the methodology that uh, 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 Commissioner Ralph mentioned. Could it be relative? Because I'm thinking about the number of traffic generated could relate, the impact of the traffic could relate to the surrounding. So if you're just maybe a corner um, shopping center right now, they're doing redevelopment, but next door is a school. And during traffic hours, that school can generate lots and lots of traffic versus another, you know, like a small redevelop redevelopment project that has no school around it. And that same number of traffic generated could have totally different impact to the neighborhood depending on where they are instead of that absolute number we're looking at. So is there another approach or maybe in addition to the numbers we have, is there a relative uh, meter or rate ratio that we can consider to determine what type of impact analysis we should do? Well, I'll add first, and then Brian, maybe you can add on to it. I would think in some of those situations that other regulations, such as the example you gave, safe routes to school, so there would be other parameters that we'd be looking at and just focusing not just on traffic numbers, but also safety as well. So in that situation, I think the numbers would are a good guide, but there could be instances where working, the developer would be working with staff for some of those one-off situations that are more qualitative. And I'll, I'll add to that, I, I don't think we included in the presentation, but the draft does include a TIA is always required for a school, a daycare, a, I think a car wash, I may, I may be wrong on the car wash, one, but those kinds of uses that generate a lot of traffic in and out. Got you, good, good. thank you. Anyone else responding to her? I, I promise I'll get to you. And, and next time we'll start on this end to go around, so. Uh, you could have had a cup of coffee. Okay, very good. Go ahead, Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, everybody's been nibbling around the edges of my first question. I just want a direct uh, answer, and then I'll have a second question. The question is, with regard to the traffic generation report, the traffic engineering assessment, the TIA, the RTIA, whose responsibility is it to prepare it? Is it the developer or is it the staff? The developer is working on it, but staff would be evaluating it as, through the process. Okay. But it's up to the developer. All right. As a corollary to that, what is the magnitude of the burden on the developer to provide these various assessments? In other words, is it so great that it might endanger the uh, developer's capacity from an economic standpoint to provide the information you're looking for and thus kill what would otherwise be a good project? So it's my understanding that the developers are working through doing kind of what's already in a traffic generation report at this point. <clears throat> and so it's really just standardizing that as part of the process. And so looking at the project location, the land use, proposed development intensity based on full build out of the site plan, looking at traffic that way. I mean, I, I mean I'm not a developer and I don't have a developer's hat to wear. I don't have a traffic engineer's hat to wear. I mean, would a developer typically have staff on board to do this stuff, or would they typically have to go out and hire a, cons a third party consultant to do it for them and then pay them, you know, incur the cost of having that, that uh, assessment done? I'm not in the yeah. weeds yeah. enough with staff to be sure about that. And I know of no developers that have, except the very big ones that have staff on, on board, so they would have to hire a consultant. But this first, first report, it's called a report, but it's literally a one page table. Okay. Uh, that that t generates, uh, takes care of the uh, trip generation. Okay, but I mean, the RTIA sounds like a big bear of a project. Yes, and yeah. there are many things that go into that. So uh, it, that cost is anywhere from usually $20,000 to $50,000. It's, it's quite substantial. But you're, we're also talking about fairly large 
uh, developments. And I'll, I'll just say HEB generated 20,000 trips per day. Okay. Uh, and then uh, beyond that. And did HEB provide an RTI? Yes, interest? they did. Okay. All right, second question. Um, I think it's well and good to get this information in hand at the time of these applications are filed, the zoning change, plan development, specific use permits, and so forth. But circumstances change. So what mechanism is there for the city to come in and on its own initiative, um, you know, conduct an ongoing study in the future to reflect perhaps an increase in uh, traffic uh, affecting a development as a result of future events such as, you know, population growth, uh, development of other projects, you know, up or, uh, up or down the same street, or, you know, other circumstances that just might change things, or um, uh, the replacement of a, a smaller impact tenant in the project to a larger impact tenant five years from now. I mean, does the city, is there anything in this that would preclude the city from, on its own authority, initiating a, a its own traffic impact from, with a view to installing, um, you know, traffic management devices, you know, uh, signalizing intersections, widening streets, or, or whatever needs to be done. <clears throat> yeah, there, there's nothing in there, to, nothing in here to preclude that. This, but this is directed specifically for the applicant-driven projects. But to directly to answer your question, no, there's nothing to prevent us from doing that. Now, what is there to encourage you to do it down the road? I'm not sure there's anything to encourage, but we somewhat handle this during this negotiation. So some of the some of the uh, zoning allows for many different types of of uh, of, of infrastructure. You know, a a fast food restaurant uh, in a in a sit down restaurant mm -hmm. might be allowed in a particular zoning. So when they come to us uh, in a zoning, and they say we're going to put all Everything's going to be sit-down restaurants in this zoning. We will negotiate during that time where we sit down with them. We'll negotiate something that is more realistic uh, for for the zoning, uh, with the caveat that that if they do come in, right, if they they might actually come in and actually do a site plan that has all sit-down restaurants. Yeah. And we're talking not just a one to two ratio. We're talking a, a one to ten ratio as far as traffic uh, generation. So we're looking at the future in the, at the very beginning of what's realistic for a particular zoning, okay. zoning case. As an example, the city recently completed a widening project on Coit Road between the Bush Turnpike and Maple Shade um, in the vicinity of the Central Market Supermarket, okay? Uh, Central Market's been there for years. This is not a new, this was not an application that came in that I know of, you know, that triggered this. I think the city just saw a need and took care of it. What is it that the city did that triggered the inception of that project and others like it? Well, that particular project was based on the capacity of the intersections that were there and the safety. That was one of our highest, that corridor between PBGT and Maple Shade was one of the highest quarters that we had for, for accidents. Okay, but, but what was the formal process that led the city to initiate that project? Is there something in the ordinance that says the city will evaluate traffic impacts it, periodically every five it years? It is not an ordinance driven. So okay. every, every year, I'll tell you what that particular one, okay. every year the transportation division goes through a crash analysis of the, the previous year, previous three years crashes. And based on that analysis, we look at the, the highest crash locations for signalized intersections, unsignalized intersections, and corridors. In the top 20 of each of those three, signalized, unsignalized, and corridors, mm -hmm. we start doing an assessment. What would we need to do in order to improve uh, and reduce the amount of crashes that are occurring at that location? And we come up with a list, and mm -hmm. a lot of those turn into CIP projects. That was one of the ones that turned into a CIP project. We, we did our analysis, we determined that was one of the, the highest locations, and we developed a, what we thought would be the necessary improvements to reduce those crashes. So that project literally got, a, got to, signed off on, I think this week or ne maybe next week, but over, the next, over this next year, we'll look at what happened to the crashes 
uh, in that location. I'll be very surprised if it doesn't do anything but go down. Okay, now I'm just saying that as, as a companion to this that you're proposing tonight, there should be a companion procedure for ongoing evaluation of traffic needs and traffic improvement needs. Well, I think yeah. that exists, yeah. right? The city has a policy. I mean, it has an entire transportation engineering department that evaluates consistently traffic, intersections, accidents, uh, all of that. So that's happening separate and apart from this. Correct. I think the primary objective that we have tonight is really looking at this through the lens of a new development or a redevelopment. What will be the impact of that on our existing system? No, I understand that. And I, okay. I don't really have any large issues with that. So. Uh, okay. All right. I, I'm bringing us around basically so we can move forward. And I really want to find out, based on what's been presented here, are there changes or anything that you think we need to address? Commissioner Ali, you've got your hand up. Question. Um, when a new development, new zoning, whatever the case may be, comes in, do we, as part of the evaluation, take into account any future project the city is going to do? For instance, if we know there's going to be some alleviation based on public transportation that is going to flow through that area that will impact the traffic that has been generated by this two years from now. Does that come into play in any way? I would, future land uses are part of that process, yes. So in cases where there's a planned area that you're saying would spill over traffic, yes, that would be part of that. Okay, so it's it's not just a snapshot in time, frozen. We Correct. It includes okay. projected employment and population growth in the okay. model, yes. And future CIP projects that, that we have on the books, uh, you know, new roadways or intersection improvements, that'll be included in anything that we do with the, the traffic impact study. Would, would it, so if the traffic impact study um, shows 2000, um, what was the, the, the uh, daily rides or daily visits, um, and we know something's coming down the pike in nine months that would take that down to a thousand, which changes the threshold of what should be generated by by what we're putting forward. Do we make them um, instead of going the regional? Do we make them just do a, a a simple TIA, or do we still ask them to do the regional? You know that the snapshot in time requires. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think the process is meant to be. This is the starting place, and everything beyond that is, nego is negotiated between engineering and planning. I'm sorry, engineering and the developer, based on those types of conditions. So, um, there's a, a number of unforeseeable circumstances like that where the process is built to allow us to give to have that flexibility in the negotiations. So, I, I it continues, Commissioner Adler. Just kind of one wrap-up question. I think I know the answer to this. I'm going to ask it anyway, um, if you don't mind. Do y'all, I presume y'all maintain kind of the base model, traffic model of the entire city. So if the consultants have, they're starting from what you know as current conditions to overlay their new development on, is that? Is that That's fair? correct. We have a, a intersection level model with all the signalized intersections for the AM, the PM peak, the uh, midday uh, peak, and then a nighttime peak. So we have those four models uh, that consultants can use uh, then there's also the regional planning model that we have for the city. But generally, we don't touch that. We're usually working with our, our uh, peak period models. And so they then just overlay their new development on top of the model. And so as new developments come in, you incorporate that into your model to build it as new developments come on. Is that fair? Correct. Well, the model's really signal timing, uh, distances between signalized intersections, and traffic volumes. So just I think because some of the answers to a lot of the questions is you maintain that base model so you pretty well know what the starting point is for every developer that comes in. That's right? correct. We're not starting with a blank sheet of paper every time somebody shows up. No, sir. Down. Okay. Great. Thank you. Go ahead. I just wanted to mention, too, that, that from a legal perspective, we can only require developers to mitigate the, the new traffic that they're bringing in. We can't ask them to fix the traffic that's already here. And, and there's actually an appeal process if the developers feel like we're asking for more than what they're bringing that would come to you all, just so you know. 
Thanks. Sir. Mm -hmm. So, having sat here in different positions for many long time, um, I've over and over I've heard people say, "How come there wasn't a traffic impact analysis done?" And it was because, well, it required eight thousand trips or more to to take place. And in a lot of the multifamily developments, they're never triggering eight thousand trips because it's not a commercial enterprise with a whole lot of people coming in or out. Um, I, I think it's good that we have a process now and we have something that clearly delineates and we'll get that information. Um, it may not be a TIA because it may not generate enough trips, but there'll be some kind of assessment done and at least we'll have those numbers. Ultimately, it comes down to us and to what do we want to do with that information? How heavily do we weight that in our decisions around the development? And, um, you know, to our very sharp traffic engineer over there, the development may be bringing in more traffic, and but there's no mitigation that can be done. The traffic is going to be what the traffic is going to be, and we're going to have to adjust to it because the value of the development is worth it to the city. So any recommendations for staff on this? I think it's well done, and it takes us in the right direction in terms of gathering information. Commissioner. I, I completely agree with you. I would have one request. I'd like that microphone, microphone where the dangerous, uh, the dangerous intersections are so I can avoid them. <laughs> <laughs> But I completely agree with the chairman. I, I, I think it's well We done. do actually uh, generate a report every year, which is generally finished around uh, April 1st. Uh, but, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> in all seriousness, but uh, we'll gladly uh, share that with I, you. I was, I was joking. I, I, I figured but, um, but I do, I think it's well done, and I think it's, it, it makes a lot of sense. I applaud you guys for the way you approached this. Uh, this is not a public hearing. Was there anybody that wanted to speak on this item? Okay. No, there were not. Okay. Um, sounds like you're good to go. Yes. No direction other than to, we don't have marijuana dispensaries in this city, right? So we don't have to worry about that. Non-legal. Non -legal? Non-legal. Are you speaking? <laughs> uh, never mind. Okay. That gives a new meaning to the word trips, doesn't trips. it? Trips. Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. Okay. Uh, last item, items for future agenda. Any items for future agenda? All right. Thank you all for your patience. Again, thank you guys for being here tonight. We are adjourned at 847.